Okay, so uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Alessandra Menafoglio. I work at MOX in the Department of Mathematics of Politecnico di Milano. Uh, the picture that you see here is the central uh, um, entrance of the, of the Politecnico di Milano, which is also what I have behind me. Um, so today I'm just giving an overview of an approach, uh, uh, which is uh, that of object-oriented data analysis. Uh, to deal with data that are density functions. I will uh, try to give you some uh, methodological contribution, but also to uh, keep uh, the uh, focus also on the applications. So how to deal with actual applications. Now, why should we care about the analysis of complex data? Well, complex data are everywhere, uh, and basically uh, everything we do in our life uh, produce data. So we can say that we are living in digit digitalized society and data-rich environments. Uh, even the uh, data that may seem uh, simple at the first sight uh, might be better represented uh, through exhaustive summaries. So even if our actual observation is a very simple object, it could be uh, that we need to, um, let's say, put together the data in order to have something more um, compact but exhaustive on the, on the phenomenon. And here uh, it comes uh, the uh, presence of PDF data, so data that are represented as distributions. Now, I'm, I will uh, work on an example which is uh, very close to our daily life, unfortunately, in the last year. And so we talk about uh, uh, an example on density of mortality that were clearly perturbed in 2020 with respect to previous years. Now, even if the uh, data that we have at our disposal are just counts uh, of deaths, um, we need in some, in some way to summarize this data in order to provide a more uh, compact information and to try to study the dynamic of the phenomenon that we have um, that, that we are observing. Now, what we see here um, are the mortality distributions that we have in the provinces of Italy along the years from 2017 to 2020. And it's clear that uh, we have a dynamic here. And uh, what we want to do is to understand which are the methodologies that can allow us to uh, study this kind of complex data. So, and study the data a long time, but also uh, a long space. And in fact, uh, spatial dependence uh, may play a major role in our analysis. Uh, again, uh, on the same uh, example as before, we have here mortality data that are distributed in space. Uh, and basically we cannot just forget about the distribution of the data in space, uh, because this can provide us with a very informative um, uh, data on, uh, on the context that we are studying. So for instance, in this case, uh, we, we might be interested in studying not only the term temporal dynamics of this data, but also uh, the spatial structure that arose uh, in 2020 that were not present in previous years. So um, other types of data that may uh, be collected in the environmental setting uh, are data related with uh, hydrological properties uh, in uh, aquifer system. These are data uh, that are, let's say, uh, classical in uh, my presentations. I will not focus on these today, uh, but it's just to give another example of uh, simple data at the beginning that might be summarized by more complex data. So here, uh, what you see in the slide are particle size data. Uh, so the raw data that are the beginning of the analysis are the dimension of particles that we find in soil samples that might be summarized uh, in uh, distributions. Uh, and, and again, uh, these are particle size distributions. So exhaustive summaries uh, that may, be, may present uh, a spatial dependence. Now, what's the problem of classical approaches when dealing with the complex data? Well, the problem is that basically, uh, most time uh, they try to reduce the complexity of the data and try to analyze only part of the information that is available. So uh, this is just uh, a schematic representation of what a classical approach would do. That is uh, that they would do with, uh, they would start with the data set of complex objects 
uh, the classical approaches would try to reduce the data set to a simple environment, like uh, just uh, keeping the color of the curves, so the grouping or just some uh, um, non-exhaustive summary, and then would try to make prediction or analysis of these um, summaries. And clearly in this process, lots of information is lost. Instead, uh, the idea of the object-oriented approach uh, is to try to keep the entire information and so to use uh, as the core of the analysis, the entire object and not only uh, some summary, some feature of the data. And the effort is to try to exploit the entire information content, which is within uh, the data. So the, uh, let's say the, the, the um, the, the main idea, the foundational idea behind object-oriented data analysis is to uh, deal with data as objects. So the atom, the building block of the entire analysis is no longer some collection of features, but the entire object, which is considered as a point within a, a mathematical space. Now, this is a, a classical in a, a multivariate data analysis where we deal with uh, typical uh, vectors uh, in uh, uh, Euclidean spaces. And uh, uh, in these spaces, basically our points uh, are vectors, uh, let's say of dimension two, but in general could be also of dimension higher than two, where it's clear how to define uh, the sum the product by a constant and so linear combinations of the data. And it's also clear usually how to measure the norm of vectors. So, so how, uh, let's say how big uh, a point in this space is, uh, has the vector, has the length of the vector um, that points to from the origin to that point. But it's also clear how to measure distances and so similarity uh, between points in this space, uh, as well as it's clear how to measure angles uh, uh, between uh, vectors in, uh, in, in, in the space. Now, the idea behind uh, object-oriented data analysis, but also before functional data analysis, is to deal with uh, complex data by embedding them in the generalization to the infinite dimensional setting of the Euclidean spaces. Uh, and, and this is uh, this generalization, uh, a convenient generalization is that of the Hilbert space. So in the Hilbert space embedding, uh, we um, imagine our data as points uh, within uh, a mathematical space. Uh, and this mathematical space uh, is assumed to have the same kind of geometrical structure as the uh, usual space, so as the Euclidean space. So in particular, we have the concept of sum, we have the concept of product by a constant, and so we can take linear combinations of the data, but we also have the concept of, of norm, of distance, and of angle. And uh, this allows us to um, build a, a statistical procedure which generalize uh, the statistical procedure in use uh, in multivariate data analysis. And it turns out that everything of this comes from the uh, from two concepts, which are the ones of operation that uh, provide us with a vector space uh, and this, the concept of inner product uh, that allows us to uh, compute angles, distances and norms. And so it gives us the metric of the space. Now, the, the, the key point, uh, uh, similar to compositional data analysis for multivariate data, the key point uh, in all of this uh, is to understand which is uh, the correct mathematical space uh, where to embed our data. So similarly as in the multivariate setting where compositional data do not believe uh, in the entire space, but in the simplex, Similarly, when we deal with uh, uh, probability density functions, uh, we have to uh, concerned to, to be concerned with the nature of the data. And so we have to choose the correct embedding for our data that may not be uh, the space of square integrable function L2, which is the typical space uh, where analysis in functional data analysis are, are done. So the key idea for making functional data analysis and object-oriented data analysis of uh, probability density functions is to understand which is uh, an appropriate embedding space uh, for the data. Now, the appropriate embedding space, or let's say an appropriate embedding space, uh, comes from uh, the generalization of the ideas that we uh, all know probably 
on the uh, multivariate setting, uh, the generalization to the functional setting. So just let me recall this because I'm the first speaker. And so I uh, just uh, uh, recall a few concepts that are, uh, I, I believe, uh, uh, known to everybody. Uh, but let's say that uh, if we have a discrete PDF uh, of, uh, of the components, uh, we can represent this PDF uh, as a multivariate composition. So as a vector with the components uh, where the components are positive and they sum up to a constant, which is typically set to one. So in the multivariate setting, uh, uh, each uh, element of this composition will represent a part of a wall according to a given partition of the domain. And uh, we all used to say that uh, the informative part of the composition is not direct, the absolute amount uh, uh, contained in the parts, but the relative amount, so the log ratio among the parts. Now, in a three-dimensional setting, so with the D equal to three, uh, the situation is uh, uh, depicted here. So the data object in this case is made of uh, three parts. Now the uh, y-axis is not particularly informative, but what we know is that uh, this three-part composition will not belong to the entire space R3, but to a simplex. And if we fix the constant to one, this simplex is the one represented here. So what we usually do in a compositional data analysis is to uh, work out to uh, represent the data according to a geometry which is well suited to this simplex, uh, and this geometry is the Hison geometry. Now, if we go to PDFs, uh, uh, actually the, the reasoning is the same, but we have to go to the continuous. So the, the continuous PDFs uh, can be seen as uh, functional compositions, uh, so as uh, relative objects of infinite dimension that have similar constraints. So they must be positive and they integrate to a constant. And similarly, as in the multivariate setting, uh, what we actually want to do is to analyze them, not the, in the entire space, which will be usually L2, but within uh, a geometry that well represents the characteristic of the data. Now, this geometry um, is the generalized uh, h on geometry that is called the base Hilbert space geometry that was uh, introduced in these two works. Uh, and basically, uh, it represents uh, operations and an inner product uh, that makes uh, the simplex in infinite dimension a Hilbert space. And now in this space, uh, uh, we are free to make uh, linear combinations uh, of uh, uh, density functions as well as uh, to take inner products uh, between uh, uh, density functions. Now, I, I will not spend much time on this because uh, this has been already discussed uh, in, uh, in previous edition of CODA work, uh, but just let me remind you that similarly as in the edges and geometry, here the inner product is not defined in terms of absolute uh, uh, parts of the composition. So as just as a point evaluation of our distributions, but always as log ratio among point evaluations in the same spirit as in the Echison uh, geometry. Uh, there are several reasons why this is a very convenient uh, geometry uh, and we can find uh, uh, very nice interpretations in mathematical uh, statistics like uh, with exponential families uh, and uh, uh, perturbation is here interpreted as a base of data of information similarly as in the multivariate context. context. Now, what is interesting to us today is uh, what's the strategy, the general strategy for an analysis in the bias space. Well, what we can do is to take our PDF data, embed them uh, in this space, uh, and then formulate appropriate methods to deal with uh, the analysis of the data and to analyze uh, their possible spatial dependence uh, if it is present. So let me uh, give you uh, an example uh, um, of, of uh, an analysis in base space, uh, just to uh, take the opportunity to illustrate a number of methodologies that can be applied in a real uh, and, and uh, uh, let's say modern data analysis. So I get back to uh, the data that I presented in the first slide uh, to discuss more on, on a possible analysis of, uh, of this data set which tries to uh, take elements uh, of the theory of bias space that today is available. 
So uh, I just recall that our data uh, represent the mortality distributions along the year from 2017 to 2020. Uh, so each curve here that you see represented in gray is uh, the distribution of mortality along the year in a province of Italy. And we have 109 provinces. So uh, the data here are interpreted as functional compositions uh, and embedded in a bias space. Now, before going on, uh, just let me say why I believe it's meaningful to interpret this data as uh, PDF first and so as functional compositions. Now, the crucial point is that these are the um, raw data. So the data that we uh, get from uh, our um, National Institute uh, of Statistics. The raw data are uh, counts of, more, of uh, mortality, so death counts, uh, in a day of the year in a province. If we were just to look at the data as uh, they are, so on an absolute scale, what we would see would be just uh, that there is a high mortality in big provinces and relatively lower mortality in other provinces. But it would be very difficult to highlight uh, dynamics uh, that happens that, that are interesting to our uh, study of the mortality in 2020. And so, for instance, uh, we clearly see here a province, which is Bergamo, that was severely hit by the COVID pandemic, but it would be somehow masked mask this um, absolute counts from the counts of other cities like Milan that were severely hit, but not so much on a relative scale. So what we really want to do is to go on a relative scale to understand and, and appreciate uh, what's the relative impact of mortality in 2020 with respect to the usual mortality or the, to the mortality in the other periods within the province. And this relative scale is the one that really uh, allows us to capture the dynamic of the phenomenon. Now, the first question that we want to answer is to understand uh, how much of this mortality was predictable from previous year. Because we clearly see here in the dynamic of the year that there are peaks in mortality that somehow we can expect. And these peaks are usually related with the winter season where we have the, um, where we have the uh, seasonal um, diseases. And then we have a peak uh, uh, in the um, summer season where we have uh, the um, hottest period of the year. Uh, I forgot to say that we are focusing on uh, the elderly population. So on people uh, um, uh, older than 70, and so here is more evident this dynamic, whereas if we were focusing on younger, uh, on the younger population, the, 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 the mortality distribution would be uh, flatter, luckily also in 2020. Now, what we want to understand uh, is uh, what's, what was anomalous in 2020? So is this peak that we see anomalous with respect to previous year? Well, the answer is yes, clearly, but how much? So what we do, is to, um, to uh, formulate uh, a linear model to describe the yearly dynamics uh, of um, our um, mortality distributions. Uh, this linear model can be uh, represented uh, in the base space B2 in this way. We have uh, that this is the mortality density in a year, which is represented as a linear model where we have two coefficients, beta zero and beta one. And then we have a regressor, a single regressor that, that represents the average mortality density in the previous uh, years. So this uh, average mortality density is the average over the uh, four years before of the mortality densities. So if I want to see in 2020 what uh, what is the uh, predictable components, I try to fit a linear model on, the, on this year, and I try to see what is left out of this linear model. So let's say that this part here is the predictable component, whereas the error of my model will be the unpredictable component, and so the anomaly that I can see in the 2020 year. How to estimate this model? 
Well, the um, typical way to estimate this kind of model is to try to uh, perform a dimensionality reduction to principal component analysis, uh, keeping uh, a, a relatively high number of uh, principal components and describing uh, the beta on the basis of the principal component. So here, as I said, uh, this is the unpredictable component uh, of my uh, process. And this is what I can use uh, to study what is left once I try to predict uh, the uh, usual components in my uh, model. And what is left uh, is here. Uh, if I try to apply the model in 2017 based on the previous four years, uh, what is left uh, is uh, relatively flat. Uh, I may have some uh, small components, some small peak, which is not explained, but basically it's uh, uh, almost flat. But what we see here is that in 2020, something has changed uh, and has changed uh, a lot. And if I try to see what's the norm of this error, so how big this error is, uh, so the norm in B2 of this error, and I, and I make a special map, uh, what I get is something like this. So the errors are almost uncorrelated as I see in the previous years, whereas in 2020, uh, the error seems to have um, a spatial structure. Now, the uh, Italian uh, people that are connected will recognize here the provinces that were um, hit by the first uh, pandemic wave. So here we have uh, Bergamo, Brescia, uh, Lodi, and uh, uh, Mantova. So this was the uh, very first hotspot. Hot uh, found uh, in, uh, in Italy. Now, the, the point now is uh, how can I formally quantify the spatial structure? So how can I describe uh, in B2 the spatial structure that is uh, present in this, uh, in this residual from the model? And to do so, I can use uh, the, the, the methods of object-oriented spatial statistics. Object-oriented spatial statistics uh, uh, tries to formulate a model from spatial statistics, but uh, for data in the Hilbert space. And in particular, I will refer here to the base Hilbert space B2. Now the Alexander. key idea, yes? So Alexander, yes, about five minutes. <laughs> okay, I will try to, to cut out and, <laughs> and you, come to you. a conclusion, thank All you. Right. So the, the key point here um, is that uh, we have spatial dependence and we try to measure the spatial dependence by measuring uh, how similar objects that are collected close by are in the base space B2. So the first point is to measure the spatial dependence. The second point is to understand uh, how to produce the spatial maps uh, from this uh, spatial dependence. Uh, to do so, we uh, generalize. Uh, this is uh, something that uh, I already presented in a previous edition of Coda work uh, to, gen to uh, formalize uh, the uh, concept of spatial dependence and the measure of spatial dependence. I can use uh, a virogram, which is the generalization in B2 of the classical virogram that those of you uh, which are uh, more familiar with your statistics will clearly recognize. If we do so, and if we try to plot a virogram in B2, we will recognize uh, that in fact, uh, a spatial structure came out in 2020 and it's clearly visible with respect to the previous spatial structure that were mostly related with the nugget effect. So in 2020, not only we see that there is something different in the dynamic, in the shape of the residual, but we also can appreciate that there is uh, a spatial dependence coming out. And to represent and interpret the special dependence, uh, we may uh, look for the direction of main variability of our data set and try to give spatial maps uh, of the principal components. To give it in a figure, it's like looking uh, in our infinite dimensional simplex for the directions of main variability and to project our data on these directions. If we do so, what we get uh, is something like this. This is a representation of the first principal component and this of the second principal component, where in black, we see the mean of the 2020 errors. Uh, and in red, uh, we see how we move uh, if we proceed uh, along the principal component in direction of high values. Whereas in blue, we move uh, in the direction of low values. 
So we see that high scores along the principal components highlight um, high values uh, of a peak, uh, so a, a critical peak uh, in April, March, April, which was the first wave of the pandemic. Whereas uh, if we have low values, uh, these are places where that were not hit by the first wave. Whereas for the second principal component, we clearly see that we, if we move uh, uh, for the positive value of the scores, uh, we get uh, that uh, we are moving to the uh, second wave, uh, whereas to uh, negative values, we are moving basically to a flatter situation. And so in this way, we are able to represent uh, our densities through map uh, that clearly represent the spatial structure of our data. And so again, we see the regions that are associated with the first pandemic here, and the regions that were most associated with the second wave of the pandemic uh, that are not the ones that were uh, already hit by the first ones. I will close with this, uh, and I will just uh, leave the curiosity about uh, how to deal with uh, uh, the phase variability in the data. Well, you see that might be there might be a shift in the data, and actually also the shift in the data might be um, captured by using the base space methodology. I don't have time to enter in this, uh, but I will uh, uh, leave. I will share my slides, and so you can find more on this in uh, in the end of my slides. So let me jump to the conclusions. Um, the reference complex data arise very often in real case studies and uh, distributional data um, are more um, common than one may expect it, that one may expect because they are very often uh, obtained as summaries of uh, data that would be otherwise uh, intractable. Base spaces are a natural embedding space for this data and actually uh, we should not think of base spaces as a space only for PDFs, uh, because there are very rich spaces that could uh, uh, be used to deal with uh, any kind of relative data. And so in particular, also with uh, data representing the phase variability. Uh, this, let's say the base space methodology is a very broad field of research uh, and there is still much work to do. So if you are curious about that, uh, um, I will be happy to give you more references and uh, to discuss with you uh, of further uh, development. So thanks a lot. Let me use just 30 seconds to thanks a lot all the organizer for this beautiful idea of organizing uh, this online meeting and for giving me the opportunity to, uh, to be one of the speakers at this meeting. Thanks a lot.